guy is actually the HLP <laughs> one. Really fascinating one. Go <laughs> into the HLP discussion. Um, so uh, we've got two out of our three panelists with us. Uh, welcome, Elena. Welcome, Isabel. Um, and so, and so Oriane. I just made it. Yay. As they say in Oriane's part of the world, finalement. Um, so welcome, guys, and welcome to the three panelists. Um, in a second, I will start to share my screen uh, for a couple of slides. Um, just to say, firstly, this um, this session, this this section seems to have got two titles, um, and one title is "Breaking the Myths of Site Planning," and the other title is 10 Things You Already Know." Don't worry, it's the same session. Essentially. It's two sides of the same story. We're, this session is all about uh, the fact that I think for many people coming from a camp management background or actually just a not site planning background, get very nervous uh, when thinking about site planning and get very nervous when faced with engineers who insist on talking about the gradients of PVC pipes and things like that. And um, so, this session uh, is not to say that PVC pipes are not important, but just to say that there's a lot of things that you already know um, and which you know from your own experience. And just talking through the confidence levels in some of these things, how they are applicable to site planning and to talking with our site planning colleagues um, and maybe if we have time talking about what we'd like to know more of, where we'd like to build more of our confidence and things like that. So I'd like to start off um, very quickly. We do have uh, a three person panel, Isabel, Oriane and Elena. Um, I'd like each of them to introduce themselves very quickly. And then I'm going to start sharing my screen and sharing a couple of slides just to kick off the discussion. Um, as Tariq says, please, we've got quite a bit of time, uh, so please don't be shy, put questions into the chat or raise your, your digital hand and we'll do our best to bring those questions into the discussion. But maybe we can ask the panel to introduce yourselves, just in the order that I can see you on the screen rather than alphabetically or anything else. So that means Isabel, then Oriane, then Elena. Sure. Um, hi everyone, I'm Isabel. I'm an IOM CCCM officer currently based in Mozambique up in Pemba. Excellent, thank you. Oriane? Hello everybody, I'm uh, currently based in Dakar as the regional um, production and GBV specialist in the IOM office and a former CCCM stakeholder, uh, mostly cluster coordination and a lot of capacity building. Excellent. And um, Elena? Uh, I'm Elena. Uh, I'm an urban planner, uh, currently a NORCAP uh, in roving position for emergency settlement uh, planning and uh, working with, uh, seconded now to UNHCR and on my way to join Isabel in Mozambique, if, <laughs> if. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I heard you can't get COVID-19 by swimming. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, well, you know, thanks, Jim. Uh, we're all very, very safe. Um, on that happy note, guys, bear with me for a second whilst I start to share my screen. Okay. Hopefully, that is visible. Um, Tariq or anybody else, can you just confirm that the screen is yes. there? Yes, it's it working is. well. Right, so right. excellent. I'd like to start just a couple of minutes, a um, couple of slides, uh, just to be a little bit provocative and just to sort of throw out some things that I, coming somewhat from a site planning background, actually think that everybody else in this in this session, you don't need to actually worry about because you know it already. Um, the myth that we're trying to break is that you don't know anything and you shouldn't ask any questions and you should leave it to the engineers with the PVC pipes. And that's absolutely not the truth um, because you know so much. And I'm about to 
uh, list some things that I think everybody actually pretty much understands. Um, and it's just a matter of having you know that you know. And here we go. Um, you already know so much about site planning. This is the message. Um, firstly, you already know, I hope, uh, that small scale localized site planning interventions, things that sort of slot in here and there, um, small roads, decentralization, as we were talking about, extra small informal markets, um, small community spaces, actually can build up to become an entire site planning strategy. And we also know that even if we are calling a space or a building by a specific name, this is our market. Often people use it for different things, formally or informally. The market becomes the community meeting space, becomes the after school learning area when, when the market is closed. People use spaces for different things. And the best thing we can do is to create spaces, buildings or open spaces that everybody can use as they wish. And the best solutions responding are the ones which respond to problems that have already been identified by people actually living in those places. Having said that, um, and having sort of started off saying, you know, we can solve lots of problems, we're not always the answer to all of the problems, but one of the roles of camp management is that we know lots of different people from inside and outside of a camp, inside and outside a site, who can be part of that answer instead. And we are the support, the channeling of that answer from other people. Then, everything needs to be human sized. Whenever we're in a site, whenever we're in a camp, we're not building Manhattan. Um, the measure of people, how big they are, how far they can walk, how far they can comfortably carry things, are probably the best ways to measure what we're going to do for site planning and how we design some of those spaces. And you can learn more and more about that um, by having a cup of tea. Believe me, speaking as an Englishman, you always have time for a cup of tea. And having a cup of tea is the best thing you can do about site planning. Having a cup of tea in the camp, walking around, listening and letting other people approach you. And also, when you think you've come up with a solution, a brilliant solution after all of those cups of tea, in the end, actually, it's the people living in those sites uh, who will do much, much more than you ever will to adapt the public spaces uh, to the way that they want them. Also, uh, and this is why I think we should actually all be in the HLP session instead, um, it's very likely that many families will not only just adapt, but they'll move. <laughs> Oops, <laughs> they didn't stay where we put. Whether that's um, uh, to, to look for livelihoods or being closer to a school, and they will take on extra risks, including greater risk of communicable diseases, in order to have those opportunities or those chances in life. And as they're doing so, um, most of the paths and the roads in the camp are actually what we call in architecture um, wish lines. People walk where they want to go and eventually that creates the path afterwards, not the other way around. Paths don't create feet, feet create paths. And then one last one just for camp closure. Um, those who are the most vulnerable and needing most support are probably the last ones to come in, the last ones to be included in some of our assessments and planning, but also the last ones to leave and the ones who may need most adaptation. So there you are, 10 things that I think we already know, we can go home or we can go to the HLP session in the next room. But there's a couple of things I think that are starting to emerge um, that maybe we don't know so much about, but I would say, neither does anybody else. What we are still learning, connecting from before the break, especially about site planning and public health, we don't know what to do about 
very dense places. Um, we're looking at decentralization. We're looking at trying to think about ways of changing circulation or spreading out um, uh, circulation, but we don't know very much about how to do that. And also, we don't know very much at all about how to integrate any site planning which is responsive to one risk and how it can be responsive to another one. What happens if we build the perfect camp in terms of COVID-19 and then discover that the next day it's the worst camp design in the world in terms of flooding risk? And we have no idea about how those possible risks depend on a local context actually might overlap or challenge each other. So there you go, that's 10, um, 10 things we know and two things that nobody knows. And I'd like to turn over to our panel. Um, hopefully that was provocative enough, enough to get people like just launching in. But if not, uh, let's start with a couple of questions for our panelists. Um, and I can just see you in a sort of random row according to when you came in. So I'll just do it like that. Um, Isabel, um, just when did you start thinking about site planning? When was the first time that you were confronted with site planning challenges and not being a site planner yourself? Um, the first time I ran into problems in a site was before I joined coordinated humanitarian assistance at all. It was in Calais in 2016. We had the, the jungle camp um, up on the northern border, well, at the ferry terminal pretty much. Um, and we had a huge problem with overcrowding. The first time we had a fire in the site was in October and it took out, I think maybe only 20 shelters. There was a lot of work, fire breaks started to go in and it was okay for a while. Then we had an increase in numbers and eventually the, the government uh, removed some of the area of the site and we had to move shelters into the site further, further congesting the site. We then had the closure of the southern half of the camp um, moving even more people into an even smaller space. And then in May, following that, we had an incident that started as an act of violence that became very quickly a fire that took out, I think it was around 250 shelters very quickly. Um, obviously, the key component that was missing in that site was fire breaks. We hadn't been able to keep them. People kept arriving. At that point, we were having to put in more and more tents and people were ending up already in poorly drained areas, even in the middle of the summer. Um, that was the first time I really encountered problems. I had been part of the shelter build team right at the start and had continued to work more on the coordination side of things with um, all the organizations there. Um, the question of how to deal with it, it didn't feel surmountable. It was never dealt with until the jungle was destroyed. Um, we still have problems there, but it's it's now a different type of problem. So that was the first time I encountered serious site, <laughs> site planning problems um, in sites. My follow-up question was going to be, when was the first time you started worrying about site planning? <laughs> but it, it seems that it was at exactly the same moment. Yeah, very much. Um, were there others who were coming up with site planning proposals who were putting themselves or their ideas forwards. So how did you engage with that? There were, in terms of traditional site planning actors, I would say that they were limited. Um, <laughs> it was very much a volunteer basis for, for a grassroots response. What we did uh, look towards implementing were fire points and fire stations. Um, we got given a truck by a festival group who make pyrotec pyrotechnic um, statues. Um, we got given a truck by them that was then run by people in the site um, and had access to water. We put fire beaters in, we put buckets of sand in, and we tried to make sure that there was a community of people who could deal with fires in the site mm -hmm. um, instead of specific site planning measures given the space allotted to us by the, by the French government. It was um, not so feasible to look at actual site planning, but more how to deal with fire when it happens as it became more and more inevitable. Mm. I mean, before fire, I mean, fire extinguishers were a big thing. Uh, 
I, having said that, and before I move on to the other two panelists, I mean, how was the decisions taken where to put the fire extinguishers or the fire posts or any of the other, you know, small but life-saving interventions? Um, does any of the, the 10 points that I had in my slide in terms of small scale, having cups of tea, does any of that talk to maybe an ad hoc decision-making process or opportunistic decision-making process, but how did it happen? Um, honestly, to wreck my brain, it's hard to remember. Um, we had large community meetings um, within the site and there were kind of community leaders based there. Um, if I remember rightly, they were based around those decisions taken in those meetings and the fire and fire truck was kept somewhere where it was close to roads and could move around the site. I can't tell you exactly where I'm afraid that has gone from my mind. Yeah, but somewhere where if I had to put 11th slide, you know that things have to be able to get in and out. Or you know that access is actually something important. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks very much. Um, I want to come back to a couple of points there, but I also want to move on. Um, Elena, same question for you. When was the first time that you, I guess, started to worry about site planning? You can say I never worried about site planning. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, trying really to, to knock my head in. I think it's, it's I, I would still call it a site, a site planning. It was in, in Kibera in the biggest informal settlement in Nairobi mm. and we tried actually to to plan uh, the kind of public spaces there on really kind of contaminated uh, waters on the edges of the of the Kimbera settlement uh, you know and then then it was really like a lot of kind of layers uh, and complexity involved and it was different than kind of the urban planning uh, in, in environment but I think the you know the biggest overview and probably not not the challenges I faced but the curiosity I got in then we actually met in Sweden in this training for site uh, kind of plan about site planning mm -hmm. because the, the diversity of group and the experience really brought me curious how how it is done in different contexts and yeah. what actually site, ma site planning means uh, in, 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 in different sectors. Mm. I mean, was there anything uh, back to Kibera where in retrospect you thought actually I should have pushed harder or I should have had more confidence or I should have had more conviction or was it all very, very tentative? Um, how did you engage and how did you participate in the decision-making processes? Well, I, I think kind of the, the, we were already pushing a lot, but the, the, I think the, it's, it, it was all about the engaging local community and then them feeling the ownership. But, you know, it's a challenge where the settlement itself basically was, was left without any connection to the public uh, sewage, uh, electricity and water then you, you have one million people actually settled there for so long uh, and because of the uh, informalities on, on the site, uh, you know, it was, it, it was hard to push any, any further than the one step at the time. Mm, awesome. And you know, the, the changes, we're talking about the connection to water, it, it happened, but it happened after three years. Wow. from the initial discussions and, and talks, so. Mm. Did you always feel that it was going one step at a time or sort of one step forwards and two step back sometimes? Well, it, it was a lot of step backs, especially when it, it had, we had to deal with the security issues. And uh, yeah, so, but I think this is what planning is. It's not a line and it's not even a circle. It's some, somehow a jungle bungle. <laughs> Hopefully not a sort of decreasing spiral either. Uh, <laughs> Oriane, how about you? I mean, when you and I first met, um, it was actually uh, trying to figure out what does site planning mean? Because you were, in, th in theory and in practice, uh, responsible for a lot of what I would call site planning 
in Cox's Bazaar. How did that go? I mean, I thought you were super confident and you know wonderful, but how did you feel about it? So that's a very interesting question um, that I'm thinking you didn't ask me the same than my colleagues, so I have prepared an answer. <laughs> Because I heard you ask them how they first got into site planning. So I was prepared to talk about my experience in Haiti. Go ahead. Um, Because I heard you ask them. So no, in in short, I first, I think, heard about site planning when I was in Haiti, doing some capacity building. And I wanted to raise that because I think it's interesting also, not an angle you might uh, often hear about, but because of the situation following the earthquake in 2010, I thought it was an interesting experience to share. Of course, the situation was absolutely chaotic. Uh, 99.9% of the 1,500 camps uh, in the city of Port-au-Prince and a few more uh, where IDPs were uh, temporarily hosted, were spontaneous. So we were asked a lot by a lot of practitioners to train them on site planning and about the key principles, because of course, we were very short of site planners and we didn't have a lot of capacities there. So there, everybody had sort of been involved to try reorganize the living space, although it was so difficult because of a lack of space and how people are just spontaneously spontaneously settled anywhere, regardless of any kind of standards. So it was a very important thing for us. We were a small team of of, uh, trainers to really be able to shape some training uh, materials to really need uh, meet the needs of everybody who was asking us about some guidance on how to, to try organize the space with very limited capacities and in those very challenging circumstances I uh, described. In Cox's Bazaar, uh, where we indeed uh, met, and that was, I think, two years ago, I was the cluster coordinator. So in a very different role, but also not a technician, as everybody can imagine, at least not a site planning technician. CCCM, I knew a little better. But then I was more approaching that whole site planning topic from a coordination angle in, in my cluster coordinator capacity. And it was very interesting for me to see how we could really have a holistic approach to site management, as well as site development, as we used to call it in Cox's Bazaar, and really try integrate those topics, even though they were probably not uh, being implemented by the same actors, although the same agency. So site managers would always speak to site planners and vice versa. And of course, there was a much greater site planning or site development capacity in Cox's Bazaar that there was in Haiti. So the situation was a bit different than the one I first described, but what impacted me was the importance of properly coordinating all the efforts and bringing everybody together. So everybody's experience could be put together because what some of the colleagues were building or organizing in in the space had a huge impact on the work the site managers were doing and vice versa. Site managers had to also influence how the space could be organized because they had also very interesting insights. And it was a very necessary joint effort is one very important lesson I learned there in Cox's Bazaar. Over. Orian, were you ever worried or nervous that the the site planners that you were talking to were not telling you the right things? Were you ever nervous that uh, you weren't getting the information you needed? Were you ever nervous that uh, they were telling you a story um, and it was not being a helpful story for, for what you needed to do? Well, that's very interesting, your question, because in Cox's Bazaar in particular, as uh, colleagues in the group might have heard, um, there is a very huge engagement of the government 
and they have a very clear idea of what they want us to uh, see build and what they actually don't with the hope that the construction will not be too heavy and uh, of course that had to do with the fact that uh, they were hoping that Rohingyas refugees would return soon. So of course that was a very important part of the environment. So we were trying to really work together as a group under a site planning uh, task force that we had there to approach the government together. But then, of course, at uh, the whole response level, we had one interlocutor who was nominated by the government to be our uh, main counterpart. But in the different camps, the government had deployed all these different government camp managers. And so each one also had their own idea and their own approach. And sometimes they wanted to maybe see different things developed uh, and it, it could vary from one camp to another. Uh, we had about 30 or 35 camps. Uh, well, 25 camps were aggregated to form what we call the super camp, a very large Kutupalung settlement that you might have heard of, uh, the largest refugee camp in the world, I think. So it was quite a situation we had there. So I don't think nobody was, anybody was really trying to hide anything from anyone, but it so happened that there was such a multiplicity of actors with different government counterparts in different areas that it was taking a lot of effort to gather information and it was not always working despite everybody's best efforts, I think. So that I found very critical and, and the most important effort to try always make sure all the information were being shared and everybody was properly consulted, including the, the population. Uh, because that was one of your points and a very mm. important one, I think, engaging population, but I can tell more about that later. Mm -hmm. That seems to be the one of my 10 points, which seems to be the most memorable. So I'm assuming that means that actually I was right in one of my 10 slides, that that slide was actually more or less correct and accurate, that we know that there is an extremely high value in consulting the local population. Um, Elena, um, back to my slides. Do you think I was too overconfident in everybody else's level of confidence? Do you think that uh, these are really things that we already know? Um, is there anything that you would take away or anything that you would add or anything that you would qualify? So mm, maybe it's just only half known. What do you think, Elena? Uh, I, I think, you know, you touched all the important points, but uh, as I was kind of reading them, um, out also yesterday, I think the challenge is then it comes to the local context because mm. they need to be contextualized. And some of the points I really hurt um, to acknowledge because it's it's not about you know these points needs to be acknowledged by the by the site planner. It's these points actually that it needs to be a space uh, between the all the actors and the local population in order to be, uh, you know, implemented. Mm. And I think that's, that's the challenge. I, I really love this, uh, you know, idea drinking the tea, uh, but to have the time to sit down and drink the tea, then you have emerging issues popping up. It, it's really, really hard. This is true. Do you know the, the story about rocks and sand, Elena? No, Jim, okay. tell. <laughs> no, Imagine that you've got a bucket and you've got a pile of rocks and a pile of sand. Yeah. And if you put the rocks in first, you can pour the mm. sand in, around the edges. But yes. If you put the sand in first, you can't get the rocks in. Right? Yeah. So yeah. the rocks represent the things that you want to do, and the sand represents the things that you have to do. So if you put the things yeah. in that you want to do first, and then you can pour the things that you have to do around the edges. Um, and I would say that having a cup of tea is a rock, not a piece of sand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I agree. And I agree with all, all the points. And I think this, you know, um, 
the idea of uh, incrementality and 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 letting communities uh, you know uh, act the the way they they feel like especially in the public spaces in a, i think it's always it's always a discussion how much you allow the incrementality and what kind of framework you need to give in order still to kind of compile some some of the uh, some of the guidelines and uh, you know some of the square meters that needs to be uh, applicable in in that particular context mm. and and i think that's that 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 is that is the beauty of of everyone working on the ground and especially for the site planners to overview the three steps ahead but also think about the today's kind of action that ha will have an implication for the protection and and livelihoods mm. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, you're talking about this sort of set of ongoing process. Mm. And maybe point number 11 is we should know or we do know that we should not walk away. <laughs> you know, yep. there, there's a sort of uh, stereotypical site planner who comes in, puts down the roads, puts down the pipes, puts up the lights and then disappears. Um, yeah. And actually what we know is that you don't disappear, that it's whatever happens afterwards. Uh, which actually cumulatively becomes the, the, that which is most important. But that brings also, Jim, to another thing, you mm. know, the dependency. So mm. what, what is the right time to leave a train that is already moving? <laughs> you <laughs> know? Very slowly. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of questions coming into the chat. So thank you uh, for uh, Catherine and uh, Atelina. Um, I'm going to turn us directly to our panelists and actually I think Isabel, uh, you would be a great person to answer this one from Catherine. How about site planning in urban environments or spontaneous settlements that need to be upgraded? Um, how can that link up? Uh, I mean, we have to bring in technical people, we have to bring in urban city plans. Um, do, do we as, as camp management um, or do you? feel that you would be happy in that sort of meeting room, in that sort of discussion? Um, I think it's necessary for us to be in that meeting room discussion. If, if it's coming up as a need and there's spontaneous sites that are being managed, um, the camp manager probably knows most about what the community wants and says. And depending on whether you can have the community present in that meeting space is, is a good place to begin. The other thing that comes up more in urban areas is ensuring that it connects to the, the host community in the surrounding area, which is what I would add to Jim's list of brilliant points. Um, if you're looking at a site, they're the ones creating wish, wish lines. Mm -hmm. um, they're the ones who are already using that land to move around. Um, and they're crucial to understanding how that site can sustain itself, what opportunities they bring, what opportunities the site brings for them as well. Um, possibly even in terms of construction um, and in a more densely urban area, which I haven't actually worked in, I'm afraid I'm more used to semi, semi rural. Um, you're very close, you're packed in with the community, the host community. Um, so the incorporation of them into the discussions would be crucial. I'm not sure that's quite answered Catherine's question. Maybe Elena and Oriane want to jump in as well. Um, I, Catherine, if it hasn't answered your question, put your hand up or type in a follow-up and we'll be, be delighted to, to grapple with it. Um, but maybe we can move on to the other question. Um, and it's, it's about accessibility. Um, and it's about how, what, how do we decide on the standards for that? Um, maybe this is a good one for Oriane. Um, I know that Cox's Bazaar, I know you're no longer there, but I know that Cox's Bazaar actually struggled a lot, but engaged a lot in questions of uh, support for accessibility for people with special needs. Um, somehow standards come into play there. Um, who's, who's responsible? Do camp managers, in your experience, feel confident enough in being part of that discussion and what can camp managers bring to the adaptation of those standards? I think what I could answer to that question is that it's gonna be a responsibility in my experience that can be shared between protection actors and site 
and management slash site development practitioners. Um, because of course, camp management having the overview of everything that's happening in the camp and that responsibility to coordinate the activities and actors and having therefore the daily presence in the camp are the best place to really see what's happening, who uh, the persons living with the disability might be and, and what um, their main needs might be as well, which I think is also something protection actors in my experience would, would look into. So I think it's a good um, uh, coordination that those two groups of actors work together. Site planners with their technical skills and their, their uh, engineering experience uh, might have the knowledge of how to build um, from a, a technical perspective some facilities or provide an access to some infrastructures uh, with the right arrangements. So I think it should be a, a combination of all these actors working together and bringing in all their expertise and, and, and perspective on that particular topic. And uh, not to forget, obviously, and I think they might be the most important of all, the community and, and the groups of people uh, with specific needs into the discussion, because of all the ones we uh, I, I mentioned earlier, they might be the ones who know the best what they need and how to achieve that. Mm. Yeah, no, I think it's a good question. Like, what if the site planners just aren't there? Or you know, what if the site planners have all gone home or they never arrived? Um, I guess it, it was that for me. Yeah, go ahead. You've jumped <laughs> in. <laughs> I'm doing... <laughs> so eager. <laughs> no, that, I, I have something to say. Uh, relating to your presentation, I thought you had one of your 10 assumptions that was it's not always about big scale work, it's rather about small scale work in most cases, I would say that's exactly the case here. Mm. Because if you don't have the engineers to build very fancy um, access or, or, or I don't know, access ramps or anything like that, you can always find people who will have the creativity and the small means it takes to try and make small arrangements to uh, give access to latrines or, or facilities. I think it, 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 it uh, needs more creativity and goodwill than anything else. Mm. No, I think there, there really is. I, I just shared the um, a different version of those 10 things uh, on the screen. I hope people can see it, just a sort of reminder. Um, uh, but yeah, I think for me, you know, there is a need to have like big roads somewhere in the middle that the emergency vehicles can get into. Um, but once a camp is up and running, and I think this goes back to the questions we've seen in the chat about spontaneous settlements, about urban infill, um, that firstly, there may not be the funding for nice big roads, there may not be the, the willpower, um, but once, as Oriane says, you could get small things in that make people's lives a little bit better and keep on just being opportunistic, eventually you get a sort of carpet effect of that um, which builds up to a real strategy and a real set of improvements. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen again if it's okay so people can see me flapping around instead. Um, I think we've got maybe uh, 10 minutes left, am I right Tariq? Is it five or ten minutes we've got left? Well, it's 10 minutes. 10 minutes, excellent, tons of time. Um, I, just, I, I hope I'm not going to embarrass anybody, least of all my panelists, um, by saying that all of them have actually uh, been participants on courses that I facilitated over the last couple of years. Um, and maybe this is my sort of opportunity to have an extra evaluation. Uh, but could I ask all of you, um, what areas of site planning or the sort of overlay between site planning, camp management, protection, um, site management, um, would you like to have more confidence about? Um, 
where would you like to have more knowledge, but also more confidence um, in terms of that sort of overlay of, of camp management, site management, site planning, et cetera? Um, Elena, how about you? I think I, I said it after the course and, and it's been what, two years back now. And I think what emerging crisis, the urban crisis in the urban settings. Uh, yeah, I, I, I wish we actually talked more there about the coordination mechanism and uh, the involvement of the communities and, and our role in, in assisting and, and how we are laced with the, with the local uh, government and the local authorities, because there is so much more to to, to be kind of discovered and, and finding this humanitarian development kind of nexus and, and what, is, what is the CCCM role uh, in it, I think it would be really valuable uh, because it is more and more to come on our, on our table. Mm. Yeah, I think everything that sort of goes beyond site planning, uh, maybe talking a lot more to one of the points that Isabel made about host communities and the fact that they're already going across the land and using the land and connecting and having the wish lines to the land. Um, Isabel, the same question. Um, where would you like to have more confidence and where do you think um, camp managers uh, generally might want to have more confidence? Um, knowledge and confidence, and I know that they're very different things. Um, for me, uh, maybe to just say I've only just completed Jim's course. This is my first mission having done it. Um, so I'm still trying to, to work out how best to use the knowledge I've gained. Um, the thing that I feel like I'm missing most is an, a deeper knowledge and deeper understanding of the points at which interventions can be done from a, uh, an initial level. Um, in Mozambique, we're currently planning sites. It's it's for the for the newer displacement. It's happening now. Um, so it's the points at which uh, the CCCM team, with our site planner, who's planned and is doing an amazing job. I'm very glad. Um, the points at which alterations can be made, the processes of site planning, the guys with the tape measures and the GPS trackers and the pipes. At what point needs to be pushed? At what point can we push? And that's that's something I'm working and I hope I'm growing in confidence in as time goes on. But that for me is currently the biggest gap. Is managing the people with the PVC pipes. <laughs> we'll get uh, that. Is, is there, a, is it just a matter of feeling more confident asking the right questions? Or do you, do you wish that you also knew more about which end of the PVC pipe was the right end or anything like that? I wish I knew more about which end of the PVC pipe was the right one. But it's also, um, just walking around the sites with them and asking the right questions um, mm. and making sure, you know, even if you pretend that you're stupid right at the beginning, you have to ask every question, you ask every question. Um, and it's taking the time to do that, which we have a team able to do, but it's still, for me, finding those points, I'm still working. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think, personally speaking, um, I know I'm sort of jumping in, I'm not supposed to be a, a you know, panelists just a sort of moderator but um finding a sort of per, you know a, a public dramatic role uh and not being the clown but being the sort of slightly sort of slow person having that mask of the slow person who is permitted therefore to ask the stupid naive questions um often helps you know, uh, sort of walking what around does this white post do? I don't know. Finger up your nose. Um, <laughs> has people sort of lower their guard and take the time to explain things sometimes, uh, whereas you might not get that otherwise. But and then if you don't ask, then they're not going to tell you. Yeah, of course. Um, Oriane, it's the same question. You don't like surprise questions. <laughs> so I'll ask you the same question again. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> What is, you know, where do you feel you would like to have more confidence? Um, is it a matter of knowledge and confidence or just confidence and confidence or just knowledge and knowledge? What I would say about this question is that at this point, I think in my life, I've, I've given up hope of becoming an engineer. So um, I guess I have 
learned a lot of things working with site planners and there is always knowledge you can gain and exchanging ideas and, and witnessing how your colleagues work. You can also read a lot of, of documents and guidance, etc. But I must admit, I fully trust, and I think with a good coordination, there are ways in which you can engage the, the experts and the technicians and uh, in a, a solid partnership, everybody will do their part. So I don't think I need to learn more, anyone need to learn more about that. What I found super interesting in the course we did, and I think is, is very key, to approaching this site planning topic is uh, sharing experiences from the field. And that's something that is so helpful because you get to hear about how your colleagues addressed a certain situation, what solution they came up with to a particular problem be linked to snow, COVID or storms or cyclones or any phenomenon. And I think at this point in history, we have gained so much knowledge of uh, every humanitarian situation we've all been deployed to, that it's very interesting to see how we can gather more experience from that. And I think that's something I would always be interested to learn more about and could definitely help build my confidence. Mm. I, I, this is a question um, because um, I'm, I'm not a camp management person by you know, origin, uh, just sort of get invited to join in the party from time to time. Um, one of the things that gives shelter people, site planners, a bit more confidence is that there are informal networks, um, that there are you know, people we know, email addresses, our peers and friends who we can quickly send a message to. You know, um, Joseph, because I know he's online, I'm seeing him putting messages in. Uh, I can quickly write to Joseph uh, and ask him uh, about a challenge I'm facing. Um, Me too. Ashmore, yeah. Uh, does, does that happen in camp management world? Is, is there those networks? And are those networks um, also providing support when it comes to questions of site management, uh, site intervention, site planning, things like that. Do those exist? Oriane is nodding again. You're just going to nod. I very think they do. And the more you go to the field, the more you meet colleagues, the more you attend these kind of CCCM retreats or events, the bigger your network and the more help you can get. Mm hmm. Isabel, what do you think? I mean, uh, could there be, should there be some sort of online round table about site planning for non-site planners? For, for instance, people coming from a more camp management background? Um, I agree with Oriane in that I think there is quite a big community of CCCM practitioners around who are, I've always felt able to reach out to, feel lucky to be able to do so. Um, in terms of site planning, I feel very lucky in that I've worked closely with the Geneva Shelter team as well. So I know that I can come to, to you guys with questions. Um, I think to have a more um, formal, maybe, um, group uh, would be useful. But I know that there, there certainly are access to resources. And having said, I can't talk to, well, there are different ways to, to find the answers you need from different people, whatever setting you're in. Mm. Um, getting message, we've got about a minute to go. Um, any last minute questions coming up or any last chances for a question coming up on the chat for any of our panelists? Uh, if not, I will ask a last question. Um, let's see, Elena, um, What's, what's the next thing that you would like to get more confidence about? What would be the next thing you'd like to, to be able to feel that, yes, I can talk about this and I can move forward about this? Uh, I think it, it, it relates to the, the last comment from Joseph, just upside down, as I am, I am going now uh, to, the, to Mozambique. I would actually like to, to see how, you know, the urban planning kind of experience and, and set of tools 
could could contribute to the kind of site planning approach and and the shelter activities in, in Mozambique. And actually, that relates that we've been there, Jim, a year ago now, mm -hmm. with you on the on the course in Mozambique in the sites. So I'm I'm, I'm really curious how my understanding change and I would like to be more comfortable of knowing where is this kind of linkages between the urban and semi uh, uh, rural kind of planning ap approaches mm. because more and more I think we will you know find these meeting points yeah I think there's there's many more and more sites where you can see if you zoom out Mm. That the site and the camp are actually starting to get closer. Um, yeah. I've only seen one location uh, in all the places I've been to where actually the, the city government and the urban planners in the city uh, preemptively said, okay, the main roads in the camp are going to be this distance because that's the exact uh, dimensions for our normal urban standards. And mm. we will afterwards turn this camp into an urban area uh, if and when everybody goes. Um, and that was in northern Iraq, um, in, in Kurdistan. Um, I think we've got, I keep on saying we've got two minutes and then we keep on getting messages from Charlie saying we've got two more minutes. Um, uh, Damien has got his hand up. Um, Damien, do you want to come in live and verbal? Yeah, uh, don't. Give a chance for you to see me. There you go. Um, so, what I wanted to say is, is as a donor perspective, and I'm called to see some uh, support we provide to shelter and to uh, settlements as part of the expertise. What I see is often overlooked. Is um, first off the inclusion of hosts in terms of service. Uh, pro to be, they offer the land, but they're usually overlooked in terms of what are their needs and how can we include them in the response we're providing to the people in the settlements or in the camps and around that might have some needs there. That's in terms of service provided, but that could be as well in terms of business opportunities. Sometimes we t tend to import a lot of things from quite far away, where sometimes um, there we have, we can have uh, what we need uh, nearby and to provide some income to those people who let us uh, occupy the land. Uh, that's what I see that's all, uh, sometime uh, missing. What I see as well sometimes is, is, is a lack of expertise. When I'm talking about expertise, I'm not talking about engineering. It's basically common sense. That's kind of a, it's a lot of time I've seen, uh, you mean, I'm talking about, for instance, uh, uh, proper separation of um, latrines from, uh, from, from housing, uh, fire corridor as well, and the proper fire um, contingency, contingency plan that I've seen quite often. Uh, and then one last thing in terms of planning is the pressure you put on uh, environmental resources. Sometimes you provide, for instance, for a shelter, you provide some, uh, some items, but for the roof, you say, okay, just harvest the hay and that'll make your roof. But then after two years, you go back to the same camp that was surrounded by forest. You have nothing left. It's a desert. Mm -hmm. So there's a bit of, of in, in some, to some extent, this pressure on environmental resources around the camp is sometimes neglected. I think that's one of the points that should be highlighted or some guidance be provided in order to uh, avoid as much as possible this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, issues we find uh, on the spot. Mm. I, I've certainly been in camps where, again, if you look at the Google Earth, um, you can see that there's not a tree left. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and the exact radius is the distance that a goat can walk and come back in one day. And it's been basically the, the goat herds that have just eaten all of the all of the vegetation. Um, well, that's when you got goats, but sometimes you have uh, you have cattle and that's even wider, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wider pressure. But um, well. We're being told, or I've got a, uh, a window on my screen saying breakout rooms will close in 36 seconds. Um, I think the next time we do this, it'll be 10 points on, we already know about the host community or the boat know. Um, I'd like to thank everybody. I'd like to thank Elena, uh, Isabel, and Oriane. Um, I'd like to thank 
uh, Katrin and Damien and everybody else for all of the questions and all of the comments. Um, and thank you everybody else for all of your support. Um, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one.